Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for bringing the rain to this uh, event. Uh, normally, I am asked to stand at the, the lectern, but uh, since I sat down here and this is comfortable, maybe I should just remain here. Uh, uh, and uh, today's positioning is such I can see every one of you, so I don't have to stand up. And I also want to encourage our speakers to be more interactive and informal. So if you don't mind, I will just uh, do my introduction from here. Um, this event today is uh, one of our um, planned activities. Uh, Every year in the second week of January, uh, RRIS, we have our uh, Board of Governors meeting. And these three gentlemen you see on the stage, they are all members of the RSIS Board of Governors. And every year around the second week of January, they will come and review what we have been doing and whether uh, I should be put on the hot grill for uh, whatever action they deem necessary. Uh, so last year I decided to turn it around and say, uh, since they are coming here, might as well be facing you guys, right? Uh, instead of just uh, having the board meeting. So it was quite successful last year. Uh, I remember uh, Michael Brown and uh, Bates Q, uh, they uh, met the uh, audience uh, over a public dialogue, uh, what we call a distinguished public lecture kind of sit setting. So today we decided to repeat this and we are happy to uh, have uh, Vali Nasser from uh, size John Hawkins in Washington DC to join this uh, hot seat over here. Yeah. Uh, and last year we talked about, you know, Donald Trump about to come into uh, a great uh, leadership position uh, and we were speculating a lot. This year, after one year of the Trump administration, I suppose uh, Michael Brown and uh, 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 Bates Gill have to uh, examine whatever they said last year, whether he has achieved it or things have gone worse. Uh. Uh, I am sorry I couldn't get enough copies of the Michael Wolf book for sale here. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, whatever price I ask, I think I will make uh, good money from it. Yeah. Uh, but I think the important thing about the topic today uh, is that the United States of America is a very important country. Uh, is a leader of the world. And in the case of uh, ASEAN and uh, Singapore, uh, whatever uh, the American government or American administration uh, does or say will have a big impact. So this afternoon we would uh, let uh, our panelists here uh, have a conversation among themselves. Yeah. And then uh, we can uh, open up the floor to uh, uh, all of you. Feel free to uh, ask questions and make comments. I am aware that there are a few uh, media representatives here. Uh, they are welcome to uh, report this event, but if you want to quote anything specifically from any of these speakers uh, at the end of the uh, conversation, please ask them whether it's all right. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you know, uh, they may not uh, 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 come again next year. Uh, I expect them to come back next year to do more of these things, you know, for us. Okay, and uh, I think that's about it. I sh that's all I should say, you know. Uh, and let you, uh, uh, Michael and uh, Bates and Buddy take over. Uh, uh, I think maybe, yeah, uh, maybe you have to say each say a few words, and then you uh, conduct a conversation among yourself. I just stand down here to make sure that the timing is right and nobody fire at you before you finish your conclusion. Yeah, uh, how about that? Michael, over to you. Oh, thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be back in Singapore, and it's always an honor to have an opportunity to speak to members of the broader RSIS community. Uh, I think all three of us will talk a bit about Trump foreign policy and national security policy in general, but we also thought that there was a natural division of labor here in terms of 
regional expertise. And with Bates Go on the panel, of course, we have someone who's a leading expert on China and Asia. Uh, Vali Nasser with his expertise on the Middle East and, and Central Asia. Uh, I, I don't have any regional expertise, but Europe was left over. And so I'll say a few words about Europe and Russia specifically. And I, I think like you know, all of my colleagues here and many of you, I'm asked all the time just what's going on with Donald Trump and his foreign policy and what can we expect? And it's a difficult thing to get a handle on because Trump himself moves from policy position to policy position wildly, unpredictably, erratically, uh, and almost on a daily basis. Um, and so what I've tried to do is to figure out the issues that he really cares about, where he really has deeply held views, as opposed to those issues where he doesn't really care. And he flip-flops around, in particular, on those issues. And so the, the key, I think, is to get a sense of where he's likely to be impulsive and erratic and where there are some fundamental consistencies. Uh, so to get a handle on that, one of the things I did was I, I read the new Trump administration national security strategy, which came out about a month ago. And uh, in some respects, it's um, a departure from what we've seen in the past. Um, it takes a pretty realist view of world affairs. Uh, the starting point is that the world is dangerous. It's filled with a new round of great power competition and a lot of other security threats. Uh, China and Russia are described as rivals and revisionist powers. Um, and, and I think there's a, a lot of truth to that. I think it's reasonable to describe China and Russia as rival revisionist powers. Uh, but then as I was reading the report, it, it starts to get a bit strange because it doesn't sound at all like Donald Trump. And I have a couple of quotes for you to give you a sense of the Trump administration's national security strategy uh, and what they are thinking about, at least within the National Security Council staff. They say Russia aims to weaken U.S. influence in the world and divide us from our allies. Uh, yes, that's true. So let's not contribute to that, um, as President Trump has done. Uh, the strategy says a priority action should be to reinforce economic ties with allies and partners. Well, that's a good idea. TPP, for example, would have been useful in that context. The strategy says we recognize the invaluable advantages that our strong relationships with allies and partners deliver. Someone should tell Donald Trump. Um, the strategy says Russia's use of information tools is an attempt to undermine the legitimacy of democracies. Trump has been consistently complimentary toward Vladimir Putin. The strategy says we will lead in multilateral organizations. My view is that it's hard to lead if you're not in the room. Uh, there's a striking disconnect between this national security strategy document and Trump's stated views. And so going to this strategy to get a sense of Trump and where he is likely to go as commander in chief isn't very helpful. And the fact that, so, the fact that Trump is so impulsive makes it even harder to think about the United States having a strategy as long as this individual is in the Oval Office. Just one final thing on the national security strategy, which is not substantive, but it's interesting. Uh, the document has 55 pages. The last page number is 55. There are 10 blank pages in this document. There's only 45 pages of text. Literally 20% of it is missing, which I think is an you know, appropriate metaphor for Trump administration thinking on foreign policy. So with that said, I, I think there are several elements of Trump's thinking about the world that actually are uh, deeply held, they've been held for a long time, and give us a sense of his thinking. And since I'm supposed to focus on Europe and Russia, I'll just touch on these basic elements of Trump's thinking, which are not entirely original, but I think some of the connections to Europe and Russia might be interesting. Uh, first of all, Trump has a zero-sum view of the world. Uh, there are winners and losers, and that applies in particular to interstate relations. Uh, in Europe, in the EU-NATO area, uh, the view is very different. Uh, the view there is that um, positive sum outcomes are possible, win-win outcomes are possible. And so in that context, I think the view in Europe on strategy is fundamentally different from Trump's. Um, Trump hates multilateralism. Uh, it is something that is very deeply held in his view of how to conduct 
foreign policy. Uh, he much prefers bilateral deals or unilateral action. And again, if you turn to Europe, the EU-NATO area, the view in Europe is fundamentally different. Uh, multilateralism is fundamental to how Europe thinks foreign policy and interstate relations should, be un uh, uh, should unfold. Uh, in Europe, they absolutely do not want to go back to balance of power politics, which, of course, were not very um, wonderful in the first half of the 20, 20th century. Uh, Trump, I think, has a short-term horizon in terms of thinking about issues, whether it's real estate deals or anything else. And so he really focuses on the current balance of trade, uh, whatever the short-term deal is that's on the immediate horizon. Uh, in Europe, I think people take a longer-term perspective. In particular, I think they understand that developing patterns of cooperation, rules and norms and institutions, uh, that's a long-term undertaking. Uh, in Europe, to put it in social science terms, I think they have a long shadow of the future, and that's something that promotes cooperation. Uh, Trump is a short-term thinker, and that, uh, I think, really drives his, his policy. Um, we all know that Trump is unpredictable, but he also, I think, very much embraces that as an approach to life and world affairs. He thinks it gives him short-term tactical bargaining advantages. Uh, in Europe, I think uh, leaders and citizens understand that unpredictability is deeply counterproductive, whether you're thinking about alliances or trade institutions or uh, things like the, the EU. Uh, and finally, when it comes to specific policy issues like alliances and trade, uh, Trump has views that are fundamentally different from what we see in Europe. Uh, Trump, for decades, has been deeply mistrustful of alliances. He thinks the U.S. has been on the short end of the stick time and time again. Uh, in Europe, the view is very different. And on trade, Trump very much prefers to deal with things on a bilateral basis. And Europe, of course, in the EU area, they have a fundamentally different view. And so on a range of issues, um, there is a very sharp divide between the Trump uh, approach to world affairs and interstate relations and what we see in Europe, uh, and a radical departure from Barack Obama. And I think that's one of the reasons why Obama was held in such high regard uh, in Europe. Um, now, we'll, we'll hear from, from Bates and Valley, but I, I guess my starting proposition on this is that I think the divide between the Trump administration and Europe is maybe even greater uh, in Europe on this region than in the Middle East or Asia. Uh, in the Middle East, there are at least a couple of countries that have positive views of Trump, uh, at least at the leadership level. I think in Asia, leaders and countries, by and large, are being careful and cautious and quiet about these issues. Uh, in Europe, though, uh, the criticism of Trump is quite outspoken at the elite level, at the citizen level, uh, and it's reflected in things like public opinion polls. I just want to briefly mention some of the results from the Pew survey that was taken this past spring. Uh, when Obama stepped down from the presidency, 64% of people worldwide uh, had a positive view of, of the U.S. Uh, today it's down to 49%. Um, when Obama stepped down from the presidency in Pew surveys, 64% of people surveyed worldwide had, a, had confidence that the U.S. president could do the right thing. That's dropped from 64% to 22%, uh, an enormous drop. And the drop is greatest in Europe. Uh, and I won't go through it country by country, but basically in Europe, uh, Obama's approval rating was between 75 and 95 percent. Uh, Trump's approval rating is between 7 and 22 percent. There's a drop of 60, 70. Uh, in the case of Sweden, 83 percent. In Europe's confidence in the American president to do the right thing, many people worldwide, and especially in Europe, have more confidence in Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin than they do in Donald Trump. Now, this survey was in th uh, taken in 37 countries. Uh, Trump went ahead of Obama in only two countries, uh, Israel and Russia. Uh, in the other 35 countries, uh, Trump's ratings are, are down quite substantially. And so that's a sea change, and I, I think the, the change is especially strong in Europe. Uh, one of the things that really caught my attention over the last uh, six months or so uh, was this survey. Uh, which was completed in May. And I just want to point out that this survey was taken 
before Trump pulled out of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, um, it was before the NATO summit, before his UN speech in September, before the tweeting about Kim Jong-un. Uh, I imagine when the next survey is taken, Trump's uh, numbers will be uh, even lower, which will probably drive him crazy. Uh, this is already having an effect on policy. Uh, Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, said in May after the NATO summit, the times in which we could completely depend on others are to a certain extent over. Uh, we Euro Europeans really must take our fate into our own hands. We must fight for our own future on our own for our destiny as Europeans. And I think already we see a sense in Europe that they just can't count on Donald Trump uh, to live up to the pledges that the U.S. has made over the years. So to wrap up, uh, one of the things I'm thinking about in 2018 and looking at is what happens when Trump's impulses uh, collide. Um, he's been very critical of trade and trade imbalances with countries around the world. Uh, he hates NAFTA. Uh, he's been very critical of China on trade issues. I think if left to himself, he would probably pull out of NAFTA and start a trade war with China. But that would be bad for the US economy. It would be bad for the stock market, which Trump cares about deeply. And I don't know how that's going to play out. My guess is that he will back down on some of these trade issues because he does care about the stock market. Um, but I just don't know. Same thing with North Korea. Um, I think he will find it very difficult to back down uh, in the ongoing uh, deliberations with Kim Jong-un. But uh, a nuclear war will be bad for the economy. I can predict that with uh, great, uns uh, great certainty. Uh, one of the other things I'm worried about has to do with uh, Russia and Putin. Um, Putin would very much like to break up NATO. And I think one of the big questions over the next year or two will be, will he take actions against the Baltic states, which are NATO allies, in order to break up NATO while Trump is in office? Uh, and the calculation might be that if Russia aggresses, Trump will waffle, Trump will back down, and NATO might break up. Uh, I think Putin sees that as a strategic priority. And the question is whether or not he sees this as a window of opportunity that he might undertake uh, in the next year or two. And from a security standpoint, I think then one of the interesting questions will be, uh, if NATO breaks up and if the US is no longer part of the security picture, will Germany be content to rely on nuclear deterrence from France and the UK? Um, I'm not so sure. Um, so uh, to wrap up, Trump's report card for the first year. Uh, in the American grading system, A is outstanding. Then there's B, C, D, and F for failure. Uh, I would give Trump a D. Uh, the D stands for disruptive and disorderly. Dicey, dodgy, disconnected from reality, disturbing and dangerous. Uh, he does not yet get an F or a failure, but we're only two weeks into 2018, and, and, and I think that outcome is still possible. Uh, but my bottom line is that none of this is what one would like to see in the leader of a superpower, and that is exactly what we've seen so far, and I fear that the worst is yet to come. Who are you, Bates? Thank, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Holm, thanks a lot. And um, always a great pleasure to be here in Singapore and to uh, have this opportunity to, to speak uh, to speak with and um, and and, and uh, have, a, have a discussion with so many distinguished persons here in the room. So thanks very much again to RSIS for the opportunity. Um, my mandate was to talk a little bit about um, the Trump administration's policy over the past year towards this part of the world, towards Asia, uh, Asia Pacific, and um, I think I'll talk about China in particular. Um, looking back at what I had to say last year, uh, a week or two before President Trump actually assumed office. Uh, I think um, what Mike and I had to say then is, is more or less come to fruition. Uh, if anything, I would say uh, a lot of the effort we undertook to try to find a, a silver lining, uh, to try and assume uh, that the uh, adults in the room uh, were going to have some influence on, on the President. Uh, or that our institutions uh, would be able to provide some sort of bulwark uh, against his worst impulses. Um, if anything, we were we probably grossly overestimated 
uh, the ability of those individuals and institutions to, to keep Donald Trump uh, in line. So uh, I think um, I share with, with, with Mike uh, a, a sort of pessimism as we go forward uh, as to what 2018 is going to look like for Trump foreign policy in the, in the Asia Pacific. Almost on his first day in office, the, the president took a step which, in my view, more than any other thing that he's done uh, in the first year in office, uh, undermined uh, America's ability to, to lead and to have a significant presence in this part of the world, and that was in backing away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, devastating uh, outcomes for that. Uh, and, and now he appears as if he may even uh, extend that skepticism and opposition towards uh, free trade arrangements uh, by perhaps uh, walking away from the um, U.S.-Korea free trade agreement. Um, and when he finds out, I don't know if he's aware, uh, there's also a free trade uh, agreement with Australia, uh, which he may well want to revisit and pull out from as well. So uh, I think that's looking ahead in 2018. We ought to be keeping our, our eyes on that. Uh, I think the chances are relatively good uh, that if, if, if he doesn't pull out of those arrangements, he'll at least uh, do whatever he can to undermine them and to renegotiate them, which obviously is not going to be good for American leadership in this part of the world. We saw almost from day one uh, some deep questioning and skepticism towards the other important uh, set of relationships which the United States has in the region for its presence and for its leadership, namely uh, the array of bilateral uh, formal treaty alliances as well as other security partnerships, calling them deeply into question. Um, I, I suppose it hasn't become as bad as I thought it might um, in, in the relationship with Japan, in the relationship with South Korea, and I'm, I'm somewhat encouraged uh, by what appears to be the President's um, willingness to support uh, the effort underway now between uh, Pyongyang and Seoul to, to reach some accommodation with one another and avoid disaster on the Korean Peninsula, but I think we'll have to wait and see how far President Trump is willing to let that process unfold. Um, I don't think any, any one of us should expect uh, that uh, Kim Jong-un is prepared to deal away uh, his nuclear arsenal. Uh, and so speaking of, 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 of these sort of convergence points that, that, that Mike's talking about, I think the North Korea question is very much uh, likely to be the most problematic uh, crisis point uh, for uh, the United States in this part of the world in, over the course of the next six months. Because clearly uh, President Trump, I suspect, uh, is not going to be willing to accept, um, and, has said, and has said as much, accept a uh, nuclear armed North Korea um, which is precisely the direction that Kim Jong-un intends, intends to go. Um, other problem uh, points going forward, uh, there's a stack of uh, proposals and plans, um, uh, various legal actions awaiting the green light from the president to uh, impose on China on a range of uh, trade-related questions. It's just a matter of when he is willing to, to green light those and go forward. Um, Many in his administration want to see some sort of a action, and uh, he clearly believes or wants to believe uh, that these types of punitive trade measures, tariffs, uh, and the like are useful to the American economy, uh, politically useful to him to sort of portray himself as standing up for the American worker. Um, and I think it's likely we're going to see some of, something of a trade war unfolding over the course of the next uh, six to eight months between the United States and China. As a result of all this, I see a, a number of disturbing uh, trends and, and real problems out here in the region that um, it doesn't look as if the Trump administration is really prepared to address. Uh, first and foremost, of course, is um, a sort of devolutionary uh, spiral that we appear to be temporarily suspended, but I think it, once the Olympics are over in, in Korea, we're likely to see begin once again uh, in this confrontational uh, standoff with North Korea. I think that's really going to be our number one sort of crisis point over the coming months. Um, 
Secondly, uh, we see in the region, quite interestingly, a sort of hedging of bets or reassessment uh, of American friends and allies about uh, how to position themselves between China and the United States. I think there's a very, very strong demand signal. It was seen very clearly during the Obama years uh, that the United States ramp up its presence, that it provide a counterbalance, a counterweight of some kind uh, to Chinese, uh, increasing Chinese influence and power in the region. Um, and uh, the region was very comfortable trying to uh, strike that balance between China, a stronger China, but yes, also a America that's present and proactive and prepared uh, to lead on economic and security questions in the region. That America, it seems, is sliding away. And what you then find in capitals around the region, I think, is a, is a, a different type of hedging is taking place. Uh, on the one hand, uh, doing whatever is possible to try and have a constructive, uh, productive relationship with China, on the one hand, uh, but hedging against uh, the United States and the uncertainties that it, that it presents uh, because of the Trump presidency. Um, I saw, for example, I think in the, in the recent uh, foreign policy white paper coming out of, coming out of Australia, um, while on the one hand speaking, I think, idealistically and uh, overly optimistically and hopefully about the need to uh, strengthen the relationship with the United States, to, to have a strong allied partnership with the U.S., uh, was counterbalanced, though, throughout what I, in that paper with what I read to be a uh, much more realistic, uh, much more hard-headed position that Australia needs to do more to find other partners. Uh, it needs to diversify its uh, sets of relationships and not be uh, so reliant uh, upon a United States which is increasingly unpredictable. And I think that's a similar debate as I read it is happening in all the major capitals of the region, um, especially amongst American allies. Uh, that doesn't bode well for America's ability to, to lead and to, and to have a substantial presence and provide that sort of counterbalance to, to China's increasing power. And then finally, uh, uh, and relatedly, we do see uh, under Xi Jinping uh, a much more ambitious effort to walk through this open door, uh, to, 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 to gain greater uh, influence, to gain greater power, uh, to shape this region in ways that are far more amenable to its interests, uh, which is entirely understandable. Uh, it may well have happened anyway, uh, given the ambitions of China's uh, current leadership, uh, but it's just become much easier for China to pursue this uh, in the absence of any strategy uh, of any type that I can see coming out of Washington vis-a-vis uh, -vis this region. Um, the only thing we know uh, from, the national, uh, from, from the recent national security strategy uh, that we could point to as a, a sort of strategic thinking towards this part of the world uh, is confrontational, uh, to um, step up to uh, try to, in some very Cold War sense, uh, contain China. That's what, that's what the language seems to be saying. And that's certainly not what this part of the world wants the United States to be doing. So uh, looking ahead then, uh, or looking past over the past year, I would probably uh, give, uh, give the Trump administration a low pass, uh, something like uh, the, the D which, um, which Mike provided, or in the Australian grading system, maybe something uh, around a 60 or something like that, uh, quite low pass. Is and it I'm, generous? Is it generous? Okay. Um, but, and, but even more concerned uh, about what is yet to come because a number of really important denouements uh, and, and, and convergencies of Trump view on the one hand and countries like North Korea, China coming to the fore to challenge those uh, assumptions and viewpoints in the year ahead. So I think we're going to have a rocky, rocky road in 2018. Well, I, w I was very encouraged uh, by President, I mean, many people have criticized uh, President Obama for the pivot, saying that it wasn't resourced enough, that it <clears throat> he didn't live up to uh, a lot of the promise that the, that the rebalancing portended. I disagree with that. I think uh, you haven't ha you, we, we have not seen 
uh, an American president who devoted as much time and energy and effort and resources uh, to this region than we saw in uh, President Obama, and that's particularly true, I would say, about Southeast Asia. Uh, I was very, very encouraged by the amount of time and energy and effort he made uh, to develop the relationships uh, with, with ASEAN partners uh, and to try to raise the salience and importance uh, of this part of the world as part of a broader Asia-Pacific strategy. It makes complete sense to do so. Um, lots of good reasons behind it and, and well articulated and strategic in its approach. I see nothing like that coming out of the Trump administration. Unfortunately, um, Ambassador Ong, I think um, we see uh, the possibility that Southeast Asia and ASEAN is going to sort of revert, revert to that sort of afterthought uh, or secondary diplomatic status, which unfortunately has and for too long uh, characterized America's approach to this region. Thank you. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, panel. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, didn't, I wasn't part of the conversation last year, so I don't have to hold on to anything I said before. Uh, you know, the conversation on the Middle East is not that different uh, in terms of the overall trends that we're identifying with the Trump administration, but it might be very indicative in some other ways in terms of what we can expect. So first of all, uh, in many ways, the Middle East has probably some of the largest hot button issue challenges that this administration is likely to face going forward. Barring North Korea, most of the other eminent potentially uh, uh, conflictual issues are in this region, whether it's Iran, whether it's uh, Syria, whether it's what comes after ISIS and finishing of ISIS, they're all in this, in, in this region. And, and how the uh, Trump administration is going to handle it is going to be very important uh, to shaping its foreign policy going forward. Secondly, Middle East is the one region where this uh, administration actually has, has at least declared that it has ambition to change. Uh, you know, Trump came in basically saying he's not interested in foreign policy, wants a minimalist foreign policy, uh, wanted a certain number of transactional things, but wanted to wash his hands of foreign policy. And nowhere has he actually shifted more than in the Middle East. And this is the one place that they have declared that they really want to change things uh, drastically on the ground, change the balance of power, change the, uh, the way things are. In a way, uh, Trump has actually uh, pivoted back to the Middle East. If Obama's mantra was that this is a troublesome region, we're not going to get anything for our efforts, let's leave it. During the campaign, Trump seemed to be in agreement with Obama. He says he's in, still in agreement with that view, but everything he does is recently, re reasonably say is doubling down uh, back on, on the Middle East. And then, uh, um, you know, this is also a region where the administration has already shown the greatest amount of tactical and strategic inconsistencies between the president, the administration, and then within the administration. I mean, even if you looked at, for instance, the handling of the small issue of, of the fight between uh, uh, Persian Gulf countries and Qatar, for the president of the United States to come and declare that America's, one of America's main allies in the region where America's largest base has been, has been situated is actually a terrorist state. I mean, everybody in the region would say that either the Americans have been too stupid to know that their biggest allies are terrorists or that they knew that Qatar is terrorist and they didn't care. And either way, uh, it doesn't really do much for American uh, credibility. Um, now, you know, one of the things to sort of think about uh, the Trump administration is that Early on, we worried a lot about what he said and whether what he says, uh, uh, what does that mean for foreign policy? We still focus a lot on what he says, and it is consequential. But we're also starting to worry about two other things. One is that it, it's not so much what he says that's damaging to foreign policy, but it's also the whole scale institutional decay of the American foreign policy establishment. In other words, the capability of, of, of the U.S. government to actually get things done. I mean, when you look at the State Department or other agencies and, and a huge number of offices are empty, 
that you might be going to war with North Korea, but in the longest period of time, you actually don't have an assistant secretary for East Asia. They don't have an ambassador in Seoul, and you don't have an ambassador in Japan. And, and if this sort of continues, uh, then that you, you arrive at a point that, uh, that, you know, the argument that we used to have at the beginning, you know, is don't listen to him. The American establishment can carry through. Uh, that will no longer be true, and actually Trump may leave office, but, but the damage to the institution will persist and, and will matter more uh, in the longer run. The other thing that we're beginning to worry is that there's now a greater sense, particularly in the Middle East, I feel it, uh, that, that Trump is more bark than bite. And in fact, the, exa the, the lesson of North Korea is that Kim Jong-un has got the better of him already. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's better to, uh, in other words, you know, Trump can say all he wants, but he n neither has the capability nor the will to actually do anything about it. Uh, one of the ways in which the region understood his trip to China was that he can say anything he wants to about China. You just, uh, you know, shower him with pleasantries and, 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 and what he wants to hear. And he, he was a sort of a nice sort of little lapdog, if you would, in, in, in Beijing. And, and, uh, and in effect, uh, uh, it, it, has, it has broad implications for the way in which other, other countries are beginning to sort of react to, uh, to Trump presidency, which is sort of to be dismissive, dismissive of it. Now, what is his uh, sort of grand vision for the Middle East? It, it, at, at, at first level, it, is, it was laid out really as the anti-Obama foreign policy. In other words, his Middle East policy is, is exactly what uh, Obama's wasn't. And there are two pillars to this. One was to dismantle the nuclear deal. And the largest reason for, for dismantling the nuclear deal with Iran was because Obama signed it and was the second most important legacy of, of Obama after the healthcare. So just as the healthcare deal had to be undone, the nuclear deal had to be undone as well. It has broad implications. In other words, for instance, there's no reason whatsoever North Korea would agree to any kind of a nuclear deal with the United States if the US is not willing to live up to the nuclear deal it signed with Iran. In fact, the Iran deal is the, is the absolute best thing you can hope for with North Korea which is a freeze for freeze and ultimately some kind of a freeze in place with North Korea, just like I Iran agreed to for a period of time in exchange for, for sanctions relief and, and economic uh, uh, benefits. Secondly, his Middle East policy can be summed up in Iran, Iran, Iran. It's, 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 it's not really about ISIS, it's not about terrorism, it's not about anything, it's, it's really about, uh, about uh, uh, Iran. And this is partly um, a, a uh, uh, function of also who has the appointed in the administration. So there are too many generals and there are too many colonels uh, without much civilian uh, uh, check and balance. In fact, when we say the, the most sane, uh, you know, rational, pragmatic adults in the room are all generals, there's a downside to that, which is there's a lot of groupthink. And a lot of these generals all came out of uh, a period of wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, where the main enemy was Iran and Pakistan. And, and their views of, uh, of, of uh, the region is very much military view, battlefield view, and it has very clear enemies. And you saw that play out against uh, the, the sort of a very high-handed policy towards Pakistan last week. Uh, and it's also very much on the, uh, on, on the mindset on Iran. And then the other part of his policy is back to the Arabs. So the Obama administration tried to distance itself from the Arab world. Uh, you know, the Arab world had, uh, was, in, was in a free-for-all. It, 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 had, it had lost its footing during the Arab Spring. Uh, uh, Trump has, has sort of has, has gone back, if you would, uh, to building uh, a, um, a, an alliance uh, uh, with the Arabs in order to contain Iran. Now, if you really thought about it, this is the Bush era foreign policy towards the Middle East, an American Arab alliance to contain Iran. Uh, whereas Obama's view was that containment of Iran is not as necessary as we thought, and the alliance with the Arab was neither as prudent nor as necessary as, as we thought. And let's just wrap things up, sign a deal, back away from the Arabs, and go to Asia. And Trump is essentially saying, let's go back to the Middle East. 
We don't have as much as we think in Asia. We can reshape the Middle East the way Bush, George Bush thought he could reshape the Middle East, and we go back to the same alliance. Now, what's the, pro what's the problem here? The problem is that the Arab world, in the way in which he imagines it, doesn't exist. It has completely collapsed. Iraq and Syria are not states anymore. They are mayoralties with little control beyond the capital city, with large parts of the country outside of their, their, their control. Uh, the one country that uh, Trump is putting all of his eggs on, Saudi Arabia, has never played that kind of a leadership role and has enormous amount of internal troubles and inconsistencies of its own. It has a succession crisis, it has economic problems, and he has already shown it doesn't really have the capacity to manage regional, uh, regional things. Secondly, the U.S. has already shown that it really does not have the capacity to contain Iran. It actually requires putting hundreds of thousands of troops on the ground uh, in Syria and Iraq to actually push Revolutionary Guard-backed forces, clients, et cetera, out of territory. The U.S. would have to commit to stay in the Middle East with large numbers of troops for a long period of time. And he actually has to make commitment to trillions of dollars of reconstruction funds in order to do everything that Trump said he wouldn't do and, and uh, he does, does not want to do. And this, uh, I think, is dangerous because the, the U.S. has set up itself for a policy it cannot deliver on. And I think uh, the U.S.'s rivals in the region, uh, Iran, Russia, have already made this calculation. And, and, uh, and I think the, uh, the weakness of U.S. policy was at full display for those of you who were following events in the Kurdish referendum, where the U.S. failed to actually uh, prevent a referendum for independence of Kurdistan. Uh, and then when the in a referendum was taken, the Iranians and the Revolutionary Gulf stepped in, settled the matter, uh, took the city of Kirkuk from the Kurds, gave it to Iraq, and essentially proved that the power on the ground that's going to decide things is not the United States, it's actually Iran. And I think the lesson for everybody around the region uh, was very clear. And the third important reality in the region is Russia. There is no other region in the world that the vacuum left by American withdrawal has been more effectively and immediately filled by another power than in the Middle East. In Asia, we say China's coming in, but it's much more stealthy, it's much more subtle, it's not as visible. Right now in the Middle East, Russia is the power the United States used to be. In other words, the one country that everybody talks to. And the one that is settling the future of Syria is making decisions about varieties of things. And, and, and ultimately, uh, um, you know, th this is now a, a reality on the ground that, that, that uh, makes it, is going to make it very difficult for the Trump administration to, on the one level, try to go against Iran, against its forces in Syria, and on the other hand, have this sort of a complementary view of, 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 uh, of, of Russia going forward. Finally, uh, uh, you know, Trump is making more trouble in the Middle East than is necessary. As if it was not enough, uh, uh, he had to make the Palestinian issue, which was dormant for a while, an issue again. The, the uh, public choice of a declaration that the United States would choose Jerusalem as capital of Israel was not beneficial to the Arabs and Israelis, who were actually building an alliance against Iran and were very happy with, with, the, with the fact that the Palestinian issue had been forgotten. So by raising this issue, he actually threw a huge you know, stone into, in the middle of the Israeli-Saudi uh, you know, love affair. It was a huge gift to Iran, but as it showed that Iran may not be actually the biggest issue in the region, that, that Iran actually is on the right side of uh, of the Palestinian issue as far as the Arab public is concerned. And, and it actually created trouble that where, where uh, one didn't exist. And he actually created more trouble for America's allies than he did uh, uh, for Iran. And, uh, the, and I think you know, when you look at all of this, I, I think the worry about uh, Trump in the Middle East is that the United States is heading for, for a kind of sort of foreign policy failure in the Middle East that may not be as obvious or immediate, let's say, in, in Europe or, or, or in Asia. Uh, not to say that those are not huge and, 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 and broad, but, but also, even though we have picked 
each a region of the world. These regions are interconnected. Uh, there are audiences in each of these regions that are watching. The Iranians have been watching North Korea very, very carefully as North Koreans have been watching Iran. The North Korea conclusion is it's not, in, it's, it's not prudent to sign a deal with the United States. They're not going to abide by it. And what the Iranians are learning is actually it was a mistake to sign a deal. They should have been North Korea. And now they are racing to become North Korea. In other words, build the missile capability, put it in range that you can actually reach, the, reach targets that really matter, and then to find a way to put nuclear warheads on it. And that actually is, 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 the, way, is the way to go. And I think these, these sorts of da damages and dangers that, 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 that Trump's you know, combination of the chaos that we call Trump uh, you know, presidency has in store that we really should worry about. Thank you, Wally. Well, um, Michael and uh, uh, Bates uh, and Wally, you guys uh, want to comment on each other's uh, respective area. You may not agree with the D grading that uh, Michael had given to uh, the Trump administration, yeah, uh, or whatever. So a few minutes, you guys exchange views of money yourself, and then I mean, we throw it to the I've, audience. As in all grading. Um, there's a degree of subjectivity, we must admit. Um, and um, I was intrigued by a, a recent analysis I think Michael Hanlon uh, issued um, with a colleague, uh, basically saying uh, the Trump administration gets a decent grade, a, fa a fairly good grade. Why? Uh, well, because of the, the bar that they set was uh, so low. Um, that, you know, we, it's true, uh, America has not found itself in a new war over the past year. That's good, that's good news. Um, uh, the stock market is up, you know. Um, the, the, he, he managed to have a couple of legislative uh, victories toward the end of the year. Um, you know, uh, we haven't torched NATO. Um, we haven't pulled out of NAFTA yet. Um, uh, we still seem to have decent alliance relationships. Um, so he hasn't been a disaster. So by that standard, you know, he gets a better grade. Uh, I don't happen to agree with that, with that analysis. Uh, I think, um, but like I say, it, it depends on, it depends on where you want to draw the line, I guess. Well, I think that's a, a good point. Things are not as bad as they could have been, but there are two things to think about. Uh, even if things continued uh, for the next couple of years as they uh, unfolded in 2017, um, you know, a year of chaos and disruption um, with you know, a number of issues becoming significantly worse. You know, imagine another three years like the last year. That would be um, a four-year period that I think we would all find quite troubling and would probably constitute a turning point in U.S. foreign policy and U.S. relations with allies and friends around the world and a turning point in world order. I mean, you know, very smart centrist thinkers like Richard Haas have recently written that this is an abdication of U.S. leadership in the world. I've read op-eds about how this is how a superpower commits suicide. And so, you know, if we saw a continuation of 2017 for three more years, I think we would be looking at an inflection point in U.S. foreign policy and world order more generally. And that's the best case scenario. And so I think, you know, we're all still trying to find those silver linings, but you know, even the best case scenario at this point, I think, is, is kind of worrying. And, and I, I think some of the damage that's been done just cannot be undone. And that's something to keep in mind as well. And again, I'm, I guess I'm thinking about this from the standpoint of Europe. But I think any country that has a security alliance with the United States, you know, it's important to remember what that is. I mean, basically, the United States is pledging to go to war to defend your country. And that's always a costly, risky thing for any country to promise to do. And I think, you know, until this past year, 
most every country that the U.S. has had an alliance with has assumed correctly that the U.S. could be counted on uh, in a crisis, that the U.S. would go to war to defend your country. Um, Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Vegetarians, I mean, you know, every president we've had, uh, you could count on since FDR to do that, and you can't do that anymore. And the thing that can't be undone is that we have elected a president who cannot be counted on to follow through on these sacred, solemn, strategic commitments. Um, I think it's a risky proposition for anybody to count on Donald Trump showing up if you need him to be there. And he is the commander in chief. He will be making these war and peace decisions. And that can never be undone. Uh, all of our allies and friends around the world know that we can elect someone like Donald Trump. Uh, we've done it once and we can do it again. And I think it will take decades, maybe a generation or two, to undo the damage of what has been done with the 2016 election. And that's the best case scenario. I mean, I, th I think as we all talked about, the worst case scenario for 2018 is a war with North Korea, possibly a war with Iran, breakup of NATO, trade war with China, uh, and blowing up NAFTA. Uh, and if you know any one of those five things happen, uh, it'll be very hard for anybody to look at the Trump administration and say, there's a silver lining. But Michael, people in Singapore keep telling me that <clears throat> how come the stock market and the business people are still happy with him? And then uh, we may be jumping up and down about what he has done and disruptive and everything, but his so-called base or the, many of the American people, unless they're all ignorant, they seem to be quite, uh, quite happy. No, I, I don't think that's actually true. I, 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 I actually think that you know, the, the, the electoral process in the U.S. Uh, is, is very peculiar because in the primary elections, it's usually the marginal, uh, the sort of the, 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 the far right and the far left vote. But in this particular general election, he actually did not win the majority of the vote. And a number of states he won with uh, uh, you know, very narrow margins, uh, it's, it's, uh, which sort of you would say independents, moderate Republicans, you know, a lot of the people who voted in states like Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, would not necessarily vote for him this time. Uh, and I don't think actually he, uh, he, has a, he has a very strong hold over that 20, 30 percent of the hard right, alt right part of the Republican Party, which is very, very important in primary elections, but not in general elections. And in fact, uh, it's not a given that you know, he or he co his coattails uh, uh, could win necessarily. And stock, stock market is a whole different issue because it has to do with interest rate, it has to do with tax. I mean, the, uh, the, the tax that is written essentially that benefits uh, the wealthy, of course, uh, Wall Street is very, very uh, happy with that. And it's not, and it's factored in certain degree of, of let's say, uh, 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 turbulence. Now, you know, the, the key issue, I, I think, uh, you know, to um, make this point, if you set the bar that like, if the entire economy and world order hasn't collapsed, therefore he's succeeded, <laughs> which is actually exactly what his people are saying, then, you know, by that measure, measure he has. But I think, you know, there, there is, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of like a butterfly flapping his wing in China, and there's a, you know, uh, storm in California measure, you know, there's in, he has created enough disturbance and change in the international order that the results of which are going to have ramifications very much down the road. I, I think the point that Mike raised is very important. The issue of trust matters a lot. Let's say even if Trump uh, leaves office and you have another president. Once countries around the world got a sense that American commitment is not 100%, and that you could have a president that comes in and overnight decides where we may want, no longer want to be in NATO. Countries will begin step by step, follow the path that Prime Minister Abe has started in Japan, right? It's, he's not going to rearm Japan overnight, but the train that already was leaving the station is already accelerated under Trump because Japan no longer trusts that a, the United States uh, is going to stand up to North Korea, or it's going to be in Asia, or it's going to defend them against China. So ultimately, Japan has to take greater responsibility for its own national security. Uh, and, and, and once that process starts, you know, even if Trump, as, as Mike says, you know, go, leaves in two years, four years, 
certain facts on the ground going, going to be created that then it's difficult to, rever to, to go back from there. So it's not as easy to sort of snap back uh, to, to, uh, to where we were. And then the question is whether we actually will be able to snap back. I mean, uh, you know, as schools, are, as deans of schools of international affairs, where a lot of our students went to the State Department, you know, how long will it take to rebuild the State Department when you have a, let's say over three, four years, uh, you, you retire most of your senior diplomats, force them out, a large number of mid-level diplomats leave, and a large number of young people who are going to go in are not going to go in, right? So that's, that becomes the, the, the generational uh, uh, sets of issues. Uh, and, and then you would say, if there, we were going to go to war, if there was one war, it would be catastrophic, or you say it would be only in that region. I think the, 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 the sort of combination of low-level chaos all around the world, short of war, but everywhere you look, you know, the rules of the game are changing. And, and, and that, I think, is we're in a place we've never been since uh, World War II.